We received a very long list of questions from your side, so thank you very much for that. So many questions that we're probably not going to tackle them all, but we try to combine some of them, so uh, you might even recognize bits of your questions. Anyhow, you apparently are very interested in what we're doing here on artificial intelligence on Eindhoven Tech uh, University of Technology. So um, we hope to be able to inform you on that for the next 41 minutes that we still have left. So um, I'm going to go through the questions um, and then either why not or I are going to take them up. Uh, they're quite interesting. So the first one is uh, maybe already the one million dollar question. How will we be able to develop AI systems that are completely beneficial to an as big as part of the humanity as possible? Is it a good design decision to make sure that all new AI systems could be turned off, for instance? And this question comes in from Peter Lovey. Thanks for that. But yeah, this is this is a very important question. How yeah. how are we going to, to do the good AI instead of yeah. the bad AI? It is the key question, I think. Yeah. Um, so from my perspective, I would say that of course we're developing. We're all in the game to create value, right? To create benefit to the broadest possible uh, segment of humanity. Um, but there are also some risks associated with AI. Uh, many have been well publicized. Mm. Um, so part of the of I think the realization is that AI is a tool that we can uh, use to our benefit, but also to our detriment. Um, and I feel that we need to make sure um, that we implement those safeguards that would allow us to, uh, to um, have the more beneficial uses of, uh, of uh, AI uh, prevail. Um, having said that, um, there are also um, risks associated with, let's say, who is the beneficiary of, uh, of AI developments, yeah. right? So uh, issues of social equity, for instance, is everybody uh, able to benefit in to a similar degree uh, of, the, of the, you know, the, the outcomes of AI if they're um, positive? So I think that's also one thing that we should be really uh, taking into account to make sure that, you know, the way we value or revalue work, for instance, um, is, is done in a fair way and in a, in a process that gives everybody uh, a stake in the game. So there's actually two things that we're, that we're talking about here. The, the one thing is, can we keep it under control? Mm -hmm. uh, that it doesn't go to the bad side and all the dystopian uh, uh, predictions that, you've, that yeah. you see about that one. So can we keep it under control? And can we also make it beneficial to both, to, to actually all groups in, in the society? Exactly. And related to that is also because yeah, it's fueled by data. And if you see that the big companies that already invested a lot in AI have the better systems that are the most used so they receive the most data, is there any way to catch them up or will all this power be in the hands of a few companies? And that's a related question to that that came in from John. I don't know his uh, family name, but that, that's actually a related question. How are we gonna keep all the power e equally distributed? That's an incredibly difficult question to, yeah. uh, to answer. I think um, from a European perspective, I think there's a lot of work being done in creating uh, as fair a possible uh, outcome. Uh, also using things like GDPR to yeah. make sure that data are not a free for all, but people actually can control access to their data and, and also have a right to insight, let's say, on what, how their data is being used and processed. And uh, I think we also will need to go to models where maybe we're not paying with our data for services, right? So maybe services won't be free, but we're actually yeah. will have privacy regarding, uh, regarding our data. Yeah, that's the thing. But c can we ever control big companies in order to be open about their data that they that they gather from us? Because it's probably also their their pot of gold. So they invest as largely in order to get the data. Can you just require from them to be open in all the data to get to get a level playing field back? Yeah. So as, as a single individual, one. this, is, this yeah. is pretty much impossible. Of course, you can do something with you know the reading the actu actually reading the terms of agreements and the services uh, agreements that you're signing off yeah, on. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but, but realistically speaking, I think we need to approach this uh, as, as a global community. So for instance, the European Union as a whole needs to take a stance and, and also yeah. find the companies that will uh, that trespass those, uh, those rules and regulations. Yeah, you said European Union, so it's, it's also a, a thing that we come back to in a later question. The other question on the control, can we keep control, also comes back into a certain other question, but there's even a website on the AI control problem, mm -hmm. or Wikipedia, I mean. So uh, it's, it's a real problem, apparently, if you have a Wikipedia yeah. page. So the next question actually comes from Will Nieuwenhuis. And he asked, how can we integrate psychology into algorithms? That's really your field of expertise, I guess, huh? I guess so, yeah. yeah. So, Will, thank you very much for your question. I think it's a really interesting one. 
Um, I see many different relationships between psychology and AI. Um, for one, of course, um, informing um, the development of algorithms will require an insight into human behavior and, and human psychology. Um, secondly, I think algorithms and AI can assist us to, let's say, extend our capabilities, our cognitive abilities. Um, and in that way, um, we also need to know about um, you know, where are our strengths and where are our weaknesses and how can we best utilize AI to enhance our abilities. Um, thirdly, I think there is a real uh, contribution to be made by psychology and also by designers to make AI user-friendly. So um, mm. to make it um, intuitive in use, um, to develop relationships with AI that are um, that are positive, that will be processed in positive ways to have AI explain itself in ways that we can understand. So I see as a, as a burgeoning field also AI UX, AI user, user experience to be really uh, increasing in importance. And finally, I think also psychology as a field has something to benefit from using AI. Um, so for instance, when we try to um, program social robots to interact with humans in certain ways, we need to be much more explicit about some of our psychological intuitions, right? We have yeah. textbooks full of, for instance, how people non-verbally relate to each other. But if you have to really program a robot to have a dialogue with you, one that's understandable and user-friendly, you have to actually make all those implicit rules explicit and really yeah, also right, parameterize them, right? So it, it, it becomes... Um, uh, a way in which psychology needs to be much more explicit, needs to, much, needs to be much more precise also in, uh, in its findings and, yeah. and, and how, to, how to model that into a system. It's also, but, but, but yeah, what you said that you, how robots communicate what they exactly do and what, what, what their rules and their terms and conditions is, the terms and conditions where you say, okay, mm. yeah, you should read them, but it's all legal structure, the yeah. way they're now, uh, looking like that's not the way for the future probably because you don't understand what's happening there. Nobody reads them. Everybody says they read them. But yeah, we have true. to find some new ways in order to communicate what robots perceive intend to do to know yeah. what their intention is in order to trust them. Yeah. Absolutely. It's that's, that's, a really that's a challenge. That's a really interesting paper. On now, which we'll, we'll also, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, well, I'm just, I was just going to give a shout out to a paper which is called The Biggest Lie on the Internet, which is about yeah. how people ignore service agreements. And, and really, it's the responsibility of companies to uh, to to make that also more usable. Maybe, user maybe we should confront people what they agreed with because yeah. there's a lot of lot of dangerous stuff yeah, in there. Exactly. We'll also specifically set from not only ethics but also the human non-rational behavior. Mm -hmm. Should we also put that in AI? That might be a diff d dangerous thing that our non-rational behavior would also be integrated and copied by robots, because it might make them more understandable and more sort of memorable, right? So that we might like them more because we we. Intuitively, yeah, have is. also a sense of you know fun with non-rational behavior. Yeah. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to go as far as to say non-rational behavior like self-driving cars or anything like that. But exactly. But like I know, know some examples like on that one. You have like entertainment robotics where where sort of non-rationality would be actually a, a bonus. A bonus and not so dangerous. Yeah, yeah. that's a cool one. The, we already said that there might be a regional difference how uh, the Europeans approach the technology towards how China and the U.S. is doing that. Uh, European Union, and this is a question that came from Jürgen Baumann, the European Union last year introduced very strict privacy laws. And do you think, or do we think, that these rules will hamper the development of AI? Are there not a lot of companies from our, you're so strict on this privacy, mm. I'll go to China or the U US where there's more freedom on that area. Is that a danger? Possibly in the short term, I could, I could imagine um, investors, you know, just sort of wanting the data and wanting to be able to yeah. experiment and do what they like to do and innovate. And there's, of course, a, a red race, a very, very, you know, s um, exponentially speeding up process of, of innovation. At the same time, I feel that in the long run, uh, it'll benefit us as a European community if we're quite strict on these things. Because I feel that if we're not, it'll backfire. And uh, we'll get, you know, into trust issues with users yeah, like true. we've had with Facebook, for instance, and the Cambridge Analytica scandal. <coughs> I think that actually backfires on people's trust in such a company. And then you have to really scramble to, to fix all the holes. Uh, I think I think we're on the right track if we do it sort of a priori, if we do yeah, it up front. I, I, I also see this difference if you if you try to simplify it, that there's a focus on, on civilian rights here rather in Europe where you see that the companies have a, li have a little bit more beneficial to be in, in the US. Yeah. And of course, in China, it's more governmental control. Mm -hmm. 
on the long term, I do, but maybe as a European, but I, I'm not sure about that. That that this focusing on the civilian rights, etc., what we are trying to do here with the AI, might be the better one on the long run, yeah. if if we have the long run still there. But th but it's a typical yeah. thing. But on the other side, there's a growing movement in the U.S. and elsewhere to ban, for instance, facial recognition. You see already opposition there, yeah. popping up. Yeah. So. Uh, that's, this is the thing. Do, do, you, do you agree with this, this drive? There's also a question that came in, that we try to stop this facial recognition because it already enters a too dangerous field. I think we should be extremely careful with it. Uh, I mean, I can, I can imagine certain security applications at airports, for instance, doing, doing that, but, but um, there's such a, a, a big uh, potential for misuse and abuse uh, and and that's that's cons that's considering yeah. uh, that the facial recognition would work really well because there's also considerable um, recognition error. Oh, is it? So, yeah. if, so if your twin brother does something wrong, you can do. <laughs> well, it's yeah. there are still challenges to to get the face recognition right. It so is okay, yeah. but probably challenges like these kind of things that based on all algorithms and learning capabilities of of machines, we're probably gonna tackle. But then still, you you get to this fundamental civil rights uh, problem. So uh, that's that's this is a, this is the thing. The other th the difference what you often hear between European and US is that the investment capacity, you know, the billions and billions that are being invested in China at this moment and also in uh, in, in US. And and we, we got even this question that came in mm -hmm. from John McKenzie is is that the US and China are s investing so heavily, billions and billions. Do you think Europe and the Netherlands at all can compete with that one, with these kind of numbers? That's a good question. What, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think yes, but you have to combine it. Not as all separate, con separate country, especially if you do not uh, 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 trying to align a little bit what you're doing. Yeah. On the other side, uh, if you keep on this focus, this, it's, it's a different kind of technology that you're developing than if you are more state-oriented or company-oriented. So I do think in this area, and I see already a lot happening in Europe, I think there's a quite good balance. And in the end, all the applications that you are making with AI should also be applicable around the world. Right. So I think sooner or later, it's going to be a big corporation that's going to be universal. So yeah. it doesn't, there's not a big difference in where the AI is spent. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I also feel that that Europe brings some some unique values to the table, right? So we yeah. have the, we already mentioned it's it's sort of human centeredness and its sensitivity to ethics and ethical values. I think that's that's a real benefit actually yeah. of being in Europe. Um, we have we have some technology areas where we're quite uh, quite far ahead. So, for instance, automotive is a good example where yeah. Europe is is ahead of the pack. Um, robotics, to a certain extent, in some areas. Um, and uh, finally, I also think that the cultural diversity that we bring uh, from Europe uh, in, into an area like AI has also some in inherent value. Okay, so, so maybe, focus maybe on cooperation there, yeah. hope is lost. That for certain, the other things that you hear, of course, that uh, like Google and all the big companies attracting uh, all the talents, and that's also something that we, of course, feel here. Uh, on the other hand, uh, yeah, should should you be worried that not all the top talent will be attracted to these few big companies that have enormous budget in order to attract them? Mm -hmm. And this this of course a problem all around the world that that people are attracted to there where they make the most money. Uh, also, considering from this region where we also think about that, it's I I don't think yeah you can make more twice as much money. Maybe that also goes for you and me, but you can make more money when you go there. But if you go there. The houses and everything, the living is, is maybe three times as expensive. Yeah. So, th the amount that you are able to spend is very similar to that one. Yeah. And I tend to think that we have more fun here, but that's probably not yeah. only well, true. We definitely have a lot of fun. <laughs> here, I would yeah. Say. Yeah, yeah. Plus, not, not everybody is maybe motivated by by monetary incentives, right? The, okay, you want yeah. to have a decent income, but but I can also imagine, especially younger generations, also you know having certain ideals and, and wanting to uh, wanting to be part. Of of a, of a company or or a university or an institute that tries really to do good with this technology, with That's this true, very yeah. powerful development that we're currently seeing. Yeah. Maybe the best is that they all spend five years or a decade here and in Asia and in the U.S. etc. and then make up their mind where they're most happy, yeah. and also trying to really remember that that everywhere interesting things happen and that uh, that you get the yeah. best combination yeah. of all this the things that are happening around the world. Okay, um, a question from Rick Boers we have here. 
What do you think about the current trend of hybrid AI? That's a very in-depth technology on artificial intelligence. Uh, because uh, the extra question that he questioned, what did you consider it really is? Because there's, there's a few definitions on hybrid AI. Maybe you have the best overview on that one. Um, I'm not sure I do, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. So I, there's two more or less definitions I could think of when, when thinking of hybrid AI. One is, of course, within AI, you have, let's say, the, the top-down, rule-governed, symbolic or algorithmic approach versus, yeah. let's say, the bottom-up, data-driven, um, sub-symbolic kind, of kind of approach. And uh, hybrid would mean that you actually try to combine the two. And I think that's actually the way to go. So it, it actually, um, you know, it, 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 it structures the solution space. Um, it creates certain priors of things to expect in data. So that will make you more efficient in, in data processing, yeah. especially relevant when, you, when you're crunching large numbers uh, of data and, 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 and don't want to fall for too many spurious correlations. The second sort of meaning of hybrid AI would be that um, you would have a team basic, basically of humans and AI working together, right? That's also a, a sort of a, a hybrid collaboration. And again, I would think that is a, a great idea. I, I'm, I'm not a, a huge fan of fully autonomous systems. I, I, I like the human to be in the loop, uh, also to address the control problem to, an, to a certain extent. Uh, but I also think the real ad, there's real added value in combining, let's say, the strengths of the human with the strengths of, uh, of the AI system. So I believe both have strengths and weaknesses. Um, none of them, neither AI nor the human is perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's a real benefit to combine the two. So in that sense, hybrid AI also for me makes a lot of sense. I, th I think this hybrid thing, with the sort of cooperation between humans and machines is always the happy ending on presentations and yeah. TED talks of, yeah. um, on, on, on robotics and the future of AI. Because then there's still a role for us, and I do believe, certainly in the current system, it is. Because I think the strongest chess computer can still not beat the combination of a chess computer with a human. Exactly. Although the yeah. human can make mistakes, but they can come up with these funny ideas to really change the field. And then yeah. together with the robot, you come to the best uh, situation. Yeah. Same with yeah. airplanes. They probably fly 99% of, of it automatic, but still not many people would fly in an, in an airplane without any pilot. And yeah. you see what went wrong last couple of months, years with, with, with Boeing, where actually humans had to take over and were at a certain moment not able to take over yeah. or had to be trained to fix the problem of the computer. So yeah. we're probably still not there yet. But will this internally be so that, that this combination human, this hybrid combination human and AI will be stronger than AI on itself? Um, well, it depends, of course, on which task we're, we're talking about, but I, I, would, I would believe that there are many tasks where, where the combination is stronger, yeah. So, for instance, you see AI being used to great effect in uh, image diagnostics, right, in medical diagnosis. Um, now, there's a, many people take the leap then that AI will be a better doctor. Yeah. Yeah. I don't believe AI to be a better doctor. I believe that AI might be a better diagnostician of particular sets of, of images, but it's just doing a categorization of this is risky, with, uh, with this percentage, I, 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 you know, I would diagnose this as, as an image of a certain cancer. Or something. Yes, exactly. But it doesn't actually know anything about cancer. It doesn't actually know anything about the patient, about being a human, having treatments, etc. So yeah, to okay. be a full doctor, you, you want to benefit from the AI, right? But you also have, you need somebody to interpret it, to contextualize it. And to take the decision that is also, oh from yeah. a legal point of view, a very important decision, yeah. But this yeah. is this is the current, and, and ladies and gentlemen, we will come back to this one, because in the end, and I'll just as a cliffhanger, <laughs> now we're not going to stop at that point, but we're going to discuss a little bit on this general AI, when it's going to pass us as human beings, and we will come back to that point. But certainly until that has happened the combination is by far the strongest thing which is also a nice bridge to the next question that came in from uh, Maarten van Bokstel um, where he looks at this field of AI in cars and you also have a lot of examples could always come up with cars and AI because a lot of people can relate to that and is it going to take over and and the question specifically from Maarten van Bokstel is what would be the biggest opportunity for AI in the automotive sector uh, for short term and long term and this is a thing yeah, yeah it is and, and you as well but uh, yeah you see actually it already has been announced for a lot of time and predicted that around this time we would already be driving around in autonomous cars if you look at the prediction of seven eight years ago it would already have happened and nobody would buy a car anymore because you just get into such a autonomous driving bubble and would get you elsewhere and the point is that 
The reasoning behind this, and that's also an answer to the question what would be the biggest opportunity, is that AI could prevent accidents to happen because a lot of accidents happen still. Three, three and a half thousand people die every day in car related, no, in mobility related accidents. And you could prevent a lot of them if you have more AI in these machines. And we will have a lot less of them and prevent a lot of these accidents if we apply this AI. Does that mean that you get the driver constantly out of the loop? I don't think so. Um, because if you have a car that could prevent any accident, why do you, would you also not apply this kind of technology in a car that's being driven by a person? Mm -hmm. And that's rather called advanced driver safety systems than, than autonomous or self-driving vehicles. So it just takes over just before that moment that you're about to make an accident. And that's the thing that we should apply in as, most, as, as much as cars possible. You should not be allowed to drive a car without this kind of uh, equipment. Actually, now already today, I think more than half of the accidents that happen in the field are already could have been presented with technology on the shelf. Yeah, so this, yeah. this needs quicker implementation. Yeah. But on the long term, that we have self-driving cars that you're not allowed to drive anymore, will mm -hmm. this happen? At this moment, I think this combination between human beings is exactly the example how this works better. Mm -hmm. Prevent an accident. Let, let the robots do that, please. Also taking over driving when, you, when you're not interested in driving, like driving in a traffic jam is boring. I would like to take my cars. Actually, my car takes over in a traffic jam. I do not mind traffic jams anymore. Right. So they take out the nasty bits like making accidents, driving in a traffic jam, these very long stretches. Maybe can, it can park itself. But to get through real traffic, and that comes mm -hmm. the part where we are better, you every now and then have to flexibly interpret the rules and the regulations. Yeah. And this is something, and we come back to that, if these powerful computers in the future would take over, uh, we should not allow them to flexibly interpret the rules because then mm. you get to some point that it gets dangerous. Right. So actually our added value in traffic and everything at the moment is that we are able to flexibly interpret the rules without things getting out of hand. And that's the best combination and an example of how human machine interaction could yeah. go. Take away all the negative bits of mobility by adding technology but keep the people in the loop in order to get to an effective system. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that the second question, uh, the, the written question that also came in, will there ever be truly autonomous cars? Yes, there will, but if you define truly autonomous is that there's no wheel and there's no people necessary. Mm. I do think on the long run, but I'm open for discussion on this one, that it will be a very difficult solution looking for a problem because what problem are you still right. uh, solving right. there? Yeah, I agree with that. Also, also from a perspective of, of human descaling, let's say. Yeah? So if you're if you're yeah. in this in this car and and at <coughs> some point um, the AI uh, you know enters a situation of complexity to which it's not well equipped, it would hand back control to uh, to a human driver who yeah. is at that moment I don't know watching a Netflix series or something and not at all aware and maybe hasn't driven for ac you know actively or uh, or is asleep for, for a month or something yeah. yeah so so that that that's a real that's a real problem so I, I feel that that keeping people in the loop keeping yep. them skilled you know for instance by driving in villages and cities where the complexity is 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 notoriously hard and where you have to sort of bend the rules and there's lots of social exactly. negotiation yep. also going on so I feel that that might actually be a good hybrid form um, of, of, of human system uh, 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 collaboration, yeah. Yeah, that also means we, need, we still need truck drivers and taxi drivers in the future mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and instead of what we expected that that would be the job that would be yeah. out of the world as quickly as possible. So I also do think we need these kind of jobs yeah. still in the future. Absolutely, and, but uh, there are new questions to be answered here. For instance, one is, you know, if you're a long haul truck driver, you know, you're still in that, in that, in that seat, right? What are you gonna be doing with that extra time, right? How are you going to meaningfully spend that time? Because because we know from from psychology that if you're just do, sitting there to be sort of the security guard of your of your truck, not um, that's not going to work, right? We we're very notoriously bad at vigilance tasks, right? Yeah. Tasks where you have to pay long attention to things that don't change much <coughs> over time. I mean, we have a attention span of approximately 15 minutes, and then we're sort of completely losing uh, yeah, losing our motivation. So. I think that's a real challenge to keep people motivated, to keep them aware and appraised of what's going on, but at the same time have them engage in some meaningful activities yeah. that don't intervene too much with the with the current driving there's, uh, tasks. There's still work to be done for us. That's, that's the thing. And and yeah. if we already start with traffic jams, maybe you can do something else during traffic jams. It's low speed. You can, uh, and if they can do something else or put them administer their their time as rest and also the 
enormous cost of congestion go down yeah. because they can drive further without resting because they had that rest during a traffic yeah. jam. Yeah. So there's already some, some interesting stuff to win already with these quick wins. So uh, let's Definitely. see. But, but on these jobs, it's, it's a general question that pops up if you talk on AI. The expectations that you always read is that AI will mean that 30 to 60 percent of jobs, and you hear everything between 20 and 80, by the way, mm -hmm. or 100 even, uh, of the current jobs will be replaced by robots. So uh, the, the question came in from uh, from Hans Janssen to uh, if, if this, do you see it as a responsibility of the Technical University Eindhoven and also our Easy Institute at this moment to take into account this social fallout or will it lead, and maybe that's the better question, will it lead to a social fallout if robots come to take over jobs? Um, I think things will change dramatically on the job market. I think yeah. that's fair to say. Um, I'm not sure that we're, we're going to see a lot of full jobs disappear in the sense that I think, <coughs> I think we need to look at specific tasks that are, that are pretty routine because that, that's, you know, we, we, we're used to actually automation of, let's say, routine manual labor, yeah. right? We're, we've already lived with that for, a lot, for, for decades and we're fine with that now, let's say, uh, although that came at a cost at the time as well in, in terms of jobs and changing, changing requirements. Now we're seeing this trend where also routine cognitive jobs become, you know, privy to automation. So right? they, so they, they took over our arms and legs and now they're taking now over parts, brain jobs parts as well. Of the yeah. things that, that, that are actually well describable, that are well defined, that are repetitive, that are well predictable. So those kinds of jobs are, or those parts, those tasks of jobs are, are I think, um, under threat, let's say, or you could also, you know, phrase this positively, we don't need to do them anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, so so of some of those routine jobs yeah, may true. not be the most fun jobs to do, right? So, but we need to actually see how we as humans add value in that process. How, you know, what is the meaning for of a job? What are the meaningful elements of a job that we want to that we want to keep? Yeah, that's true. For ourselves, um, and how do we train people to maybe be more on at a supervisory level? You know, be, be able to keep the overview, being able to yeah. to to uh, to be in the loop of of this robot doing 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 routine uh, tasks or this AI doing routine tasks, um, so it will redefine the job market to an extent. Um, and and the question also is, you know, to what extent do we have a responsibility? Uh, I think we do. As a university, yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah, think yeah, we true. do. Uh, first of all, we're an educational institute, so of yeah. course we want to we want to educate our students not you know for, for the future routine, jobs, yeah, routine yeah. cognitive jobs, but the creative ones, yeah. right? The ones that that require twenty first century skills. That require communication, and emotional intelligence, all exactly, this kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. those things will become more and more important in our educational portfolio, in the experiences that we give our students. Secondly, as a research facility, I think we also have a responsibility. We have a group in our in our university, human performance management, mm -hmm. who's looked at looking exactly at this kind of a, a, a topic. Right. So, what does automation mean for work? How do we collaborate with robots? What will be the new social roles? What will be new wor work roles? And in that, in that sense, we're also trying to contribute, let's say, in, in terms of the content of how that change is going to affect society. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, and thirdly, I think there's an, there's an illusion that, you know, we're still, um, you know, teaching people a job that they will have for 40 years. Because yeah. society and technology is changing so rapidly that every five or ten years your job will probably be changed in certain in certain terms of the yep. of the of the of the <coughs> requirements that you have of the skills that you need to develop. So I think as a university we should probably also um, be uh, sensitive to this need for lifelong learning for exactly. continual change. So not just drop somebody off at the, at the job market, yep. but keep engaged, keep you know honing their skills, keep keep having them come back. Yeah, yeah, we no learn no. from their work experience how work life is affecting them, how automation has has changed their job requirements, and we try to you know, adapt and our university to that as well. And build some flexibility in the students because there's exactly. not a fixed job that you can specify that it will do. I, I, of, I often make the comparison to, uh, to farmers, you know, 150, 200 years ago, I think 70% of the society was farmers yeah. or directly or indirectly related with farming. And if back nowadays it's 3%. It doesn't mean that 67% of people are doing nothing. No, exactly. Because, and if you would have asked a farmer back then what all these people would do, he would not have come up with the things that we're doing now, like being uh, an app developer or a yoga coach yeah. or uh, wh whatever you're doing at this moment or an influencer, you know, these kind of jobs. 
the, the farmer really had no idea what that would, how that would bring food on the plate, you know, yeah. that because that was their, their single thing. So again, now we probably cannot imagine what kind of jobs we're doing in the future. Yeah. Just to make sure that you make this change. It's going to change from the repetitive jobs to the more yeah. creative stuff. And I think also the people that, that work with their hands are quite safe and uh, they're, they're really yeah. skilled trained people. But uh, yeah, what kind of jobs are coming? To relate to what we just said earlier, I think let leave the robots to do these repetitive jobs, to all the things to to color inside the lines, all this this, this regulatory mm -hmm. procedural jobs that that we anyhow didn't like to do so, so that our own added values that we can do a little bit the yeah. drawing outside the lines, etc. And yeah. that's where the added value is probably in the future. Yeah, so and, and it's, get, it's and getting interesting. Human interaction or quality yeah, this, this so is the, the experience process. economy, you know? Absolutely. You still so want to meet people. One, one example, you, you mentioned farms. Um, you know, as, as, we're, as we're speaking here today, you know, farms are being criticized for, you know, a certain <coughs> pollution level, etc. Um, and you see that new farmers are looking for new ways to, yeah. to, to utilize their skills. And, and so this really nice... Um, a program on the TV the other day where, where there was a farmer who was actually selling off his farm but, but reutilizing his farm as a, as a care farm for you know, taking care of senior exactly. citizens. Because people are very happy in this. Exactly. It's it's a social it addresses skills. your, your mass of pyramid it, yeah. to yeah. go for food. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So it gets only in more interesting. I think so. so. And, and indeed, you know, the, the, car, the countries that have the highest degree of automation have also the lowest level of unemployment. So it's yeah. not, which is contradictory to what you would expect. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that's 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 the good thing. So don't be too afraid. Um, the other thing is this is rather on your, uh, uh, especially my guest. The the world of AI currently suffers quite a lot from what you could call the white male syndrome. Um, there's a question coming in from Sitra Kupa, Kupta. Sorry. Uh, what do you, as Technical University Eindhoven, do to correct this with regard to gender and ethnicity? It's a it's a known problem. We have two white males. Get yeah, here two this, uh, two yeah. my white so middle aged. Apologize. Uh, <laughs> a priori here, here we go. In this area. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's it's. I can only say that, that we have increased awareness that this is a problem, right? Yeah. So um, for one, of course, if you're developing applications that are being used by most of the population and a great diversity of, of cultures and you only have a very small segment of 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 you know cultural backgrounds or or, or or gender identity responsible for that development just from a from a point of view of of knowing sort of empathizing with with that that other role is already a limiting factor i think yep. in, in 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 your in your design view now for one as designers, um, we have methods to sensitize us to other cultures, to other ways of living, to other value systems. Um, huh? So value-sensitive design, user-centered design, person-centric design. Um, and you have to really engage with, with people and other cultures. Um, uh, on the other hand, you also have to bring them in. Right? You have to have an active strategy of, of making sure that they're part of your community, that they yeah. become part, that they feel welcome in this community. And, of course, TUE has, has recently had very active uh, policy in, in trying to engage female scientists to also join the ranks here at, at, at TUE. Um, and I think, I think that's a really good thing because that broadens the perspective and only makes us smarter as a university. So, and, and the same holds true for you know, people from other cultures, etc. So I think it's an important point and, and we're, we're trying to address it as well as we can. And of course, there's still lots to learn. Um, I'm happy to say, by the way, that we have quite a, a thriving international community also at this, that, at this university. That runs well, yeah. Yeah, so we, we're happy to welcome, you know, many different cultures, uh, and, and, and hopefully that will also show in the quality of the work that we do. Absolutely. A long time ago when I studied here, actually, the, it, it was a very male university. It was a very white and a very Dutch university. Yeah. So it also depends a little. We have to give it a little bit of time. Probably in 30 years from now, this same Q&A session will be done by less middle-aged <laughs> white men than, uh, than is currently yeah, the case but uh, so. yeah let, let perhaps, perhaps two robots <laughs> or, or two robots yeah because that's the point now we come to this very yeah, important fine. question and and uh, maybe an almost religious discussion uh, that that nobody knows exactly the answer for is is there's and, and and how how much is this hype is ai ever going to pass us do we reach this level of, of general artificial intelligence that these computers are just as wise as we are? Or is it already behind us that they already took over and pushed us in some kind of simulation 
and oh. we're just happy <laughs> working on a university. But that, yeah. that's, that going very far off. But, but it's actually the question that we have, uh, maybe in general, when, when do we have this general AI? It's an often posed question, but uh, that's, that's what, what, what's your answer? Because it's, it's asked so often. It's, it's hard to ask to answer this question with any kind of scientific certainty. So, so it, it really is, is um, I think, I'm, I'm really skeptical uh, about us, about anybody who claims yeah. to have a reliable answer to this question, right? I'm not saying it's never going to happen. I'm just saying we don't yeah. have enough <coughs> information to make a reliable estimation as to, as to when it might happen. It might not, it might, and we don't know exactly how likely it is, and we don't know if it is likely when it wi will occur. Remember, 50 years ago, eh, back in the 60s yeah. and 70s, they, was, they were saying that artificial general intelligence was <coughs> only 50 years away. Well, we're, we're here now. Yeah, we didn't make that. We're, we're nowhere near. We're yep. nowhere near. I mean, uh, people at Facebook, the AI people there, are sort of really happy if they can recognize different farm animals in a picture, right? So that's, the, you know, th there, is, there are some, some of those very fundamental sort of perceptual categorization problems that are being worked on. Um, what I should add to this, though, is that Already, AI is much smarter than us in certain very thin slices of, 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 of behavior, right? So That's true. The so there's general choice. intelligence is there, but, but specific intelligence passed us yeah. in some things? In some, in some way, yeah. But, okay, although it might not be general intelligence again, the impact of being very good at one point can already be very, Absolutely. very huge. Yeah. So the worry that I have, because um, uh, I do worry sometimes about AI, but I, I think it's, uh, it's not so much about this idea of super intelligence or... Or you know this 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 point of of you know th th that that all of a sudden we come in sort of this recursive self improvement uh, of uh, of AI, um, but but I'm I'm more worried about human uses, um, misuses or misunderstandings in relation to uh, you know AI and what it can do. So for instance, um, not so much smart systems but stupid systems ruling the world, and we over endow them with certain responsibilities because we think, you know, they've been programmed and, and, and we trust yeah, them. And, that's true. and then all of a sudden, you know, they make mistakes that we can't predict or that we find difficult to predict because they're so unintuitive to us sometimes. Um, or we give them a lot of decisional capability. For instance, if you have AI that would trade on the stock market, right? And it would have decisional capabilities to yes, exactly. shift around large sums of money in microseconds. I mean, that could have a real impact on our lives, uh, and it being a very, it's not at all a generalized But should you, should you, this kind of things, this kind of decision making, should you forbid AI, or should you try to build in some, some implicit value system, so value by design, that it knows at a certain moment that it cannot pass a rule? Well, certainly, certainly I the latter, I think, would be, would be something we want, yeah. but that's also very difficult to do, so I think we need a combination of of having uh, certain fail-safes, let's say, certain values being in, being in place, as well <coughs> as an oversight and control. Yeah. Right? You still need to have um, a, a, a level of human decision-making. And it's going to be a universal control, so our friend Kim Jong-un and all has to join on this Well, this, this is a problem. worry, actually, because, of course, there's many different places where AI is being developed. Of course. And, you know, this, this is kind of the rat race that we're in. And I think, for me, rather than you know, having worrying about this generalized intelligence. I worry, for instance, about very smart weaponized systems, right? So yes, it's something that can do one thing very good but have a huge impact exactly, on itself. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's a real. That's a real. So, risk. so we that that's a thing that we I think sh we should start investing already now to have some kind of general rules, universal that we should imply right now before it comes. Because if people says from it's going to be in 50 years, or if they said this 50 years ago, it didn't happen now. Does it mean that it's not going to happen, or does it mean that their estimation was a little bit too optimistic? Because we have another billion years to go or something uh, on this well, universe, so yeah. it, it might happen sooner or later. Uh, Sam Harris had a very good talk on this one, you might mm. have seen it, where he says, yeah, if, if it not happened, it must either be because suddenly the, the, the development of systems, the exponential uh, increasing intelligence of systems mm. should stop, which he says is not going to happen, there's no reason to do so, we don't want to do so. Or uh, are we already as humans on the top of intelligence, which is certainly not the case. No, we can go no much idea. further beyond that. And then you come to this m almost religious question, is uh, general intelligence so much different than artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. Isn't our human intelligence just at this moment on the top of, at this moment on the top of artificial intelligence? And are we going any further on that one? 
this is a discussion that's still open. Read about that. There's a lot of things happening on these these kind of stuff, and 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 we can send you some links. Be come in contact. Yeah. It's a discussion that we should start with the entire universe, I guess, because there's there's a lot of important things to use. And we can also join forces, of course, that we just use this calculation power and extra sensors to make us some kind of superhumans. That's another prediction that you can do, that you just join forces, which yeah. also has a lot of consequences. But uh, yeah, that's a little bit too long in order to tackle this here. Because I want to come to a last question that um, Juan Verdad uh, posed to us. And he said, uh, I understand that the Technical University Eindhoven has ambition plans in the field of AI. Can you tell a little bit about this? And of course, this is this is not an advertisement, but uh, we are quite proud that we did start indeed half a year ago in order to uh, focus on everything that we already were doing on AI, because you are here already for a long time doing AI together with a lot of other professors. We have about 100 people in the scientific staff posing on this one. And so we, we joined that forces in order to, to really step up. We invested quite heavily also in order to hire 50 extra uh, scientific staff. But we also choose a clear focus because we do see a change at this moment that from AI that used to be based upon what consumer input, you know, what Google, all these fantastic things they're doing. It's rather uh, consumer input, but now you see the machines making more data than what, uh, what, what humans can do. And then also machines do stuff with this data with artificial intelligence in between. That's something that in all modesty, we see ourselves as specialists here at Eindhoven University of Technology and that we also want to step up now. We're hiring 50 plus people. We are setting up new PhD programs. We're also making new masters on AI and the first one start already in September. Uh, we're coming with new bachelors in the future as well. So you really can also study AI here. And I hope more universities do that. We know more universities do that. So yeah. in close cooperation, we can actually tackle all these challenges that we talked about. But we are relatively positive that the benefits are a little bit heavier than, than all these this, this, this bad dystopian things that we talked about, as it was with all different technologies that we ever developed. When we invented fire, it was a lot of extra comfort, but we could also burn our fingers, mm -hmm. etc. But bottom line, we're happy that we invented fire and we have w that we invented everything since. And I also hope now the benefits will prevail over all the negative stuff that you can think about but you should think about it and act if necessary. Yeah, Any last points that you want to share? Because yeah, well just just uh, uh, to, to reiterate, reiterate your point, I think, I think developing AI for the real world is real, a real interesting challenge. That's and and I, I think we need to make it human-centered. Um, I think we need to keep humans in the loop. I think we need to think about ethics and values. And luckily, we're also in a context at Eindhoven University of Technology where that's really on the agenda. So I think you know together, those two things, okay. right? The, the machine data perspective as well as the human perspectives <coughs> really uh, create a unique uh, ecosystem here. Okay, so we're, that's why we look so happy probably because we are able to work here. Thank you very much for joining us and for all the questions that you get. Keep in touch. If there's anything you want to know, you probably will find the links on the uh, website. And uh, if it's not here at university, also try to, to use all the talent that's on the other side of the screen here in order to, uh, to make this a little bit better world. And uh, yeah, if so, we might meet you also in person in the future. Thanks for now and uh, hope that you uh, keep aligned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Carla. Bye.